of all, let me say thank you to um, Tom and Lee and Paul for, uh, for inviting me to participate in this. And it is unfortunately my, the first time I've been to a youth conference. I was aware of them, but never able to put together the time and resources to travel to the place, the wonderful places where they were, and I heard a lot about them. So I'm really glad it came to the United States. And um, when Lee suggested that I could give a talk, I, it actually took me a long time, all the way up until this morning even, to decide exactly what I was going to talk about and say, because um, in some ways I, f I uh, connect a lot with Lee's messages about the fact that what we're doing is you know, at the end of, toward the end of our careers, we're passing the baton to the next generation. And if I look back, there are lots of changes along the way. Um, and so I also have to express um, a deep sense of gratitude and thank you to my co-partner in crime, um, David Parker, who without, without whom I really couldn't have done the research uh, that was focused on interventions in small businesses, starting in woodworking and then metal fabrication and auto body repair. And so what I'm going to talk about today is the sort of last randomized controlled trial I worked on, which was more of a total worker health kind of study. But I am using it as a, as a sort of launching pad for talking about subjects that have become a little more of interest to me recently in the context of the fissured workplace and the num growing number of precarious jobs. And it's not just anymore in a few sectors and a few kinds of jobs. It's all economic sectors. And it's all levels of all economic sectors, including what I've begun to see are, are the students that I train, the occupational health and safety professionals, are now moving into much more precarious job situations, employment situations. So how do I prepare them for understanding what the world of work is like and going to be like in the future? And how do I make sure that they're ready to deal with all the, you know, the um, challenges they're going to face in this new world of work, which is their world of work, as well as the people they care about and, um, and, and will impact in terms of the, their health? The, the workers they're, they're going to focus on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this workplace safety and smoking cessation intervention study, but it's really as a goal to try and explore some of the th my, think my uh, evolution in thinking about um, health for workers. So um, my take home message, so I'll come back to this, but I wanted to give this, I tell my students, use the pyramid method, tell them the most important message up front. So I'm going to do that right here. My take home message is that uh, as much as occupational health and safety professionals or health promotion professionals or whatever field you're in, as much as it might not feel like the right thing to do, we have to think across all of our professional expertise much more broadly about work and health in particular for people at work. So that's what I'm going to focus on is what is, what is it that impacts the, the health of people at work. And the panel uh, just, uh, just before us was actually great because they illustrated a lot of the concepts I'm going to talk about. O Occupational health and safety professionals have focused on workplace conditions, which I list here is an industrial hygienist, is chemical, physical, biological hazards. More recently, I've been teaching a course in psychosocial stressors. And I will tell you, I am not at all an expert in that. But it has opened my eyes to understanding what I'll call workplace or working or job conditions. Um, and those are vast, myriad variety of things that all are just as important as the workplace conditions. And then even more recently, I've come to realize that we also have responsibility for thinking about employment conditions, pay, benefit, hours, opportunities for advancement, and other things, as well as the things that happen outside of work. And that's just what the panel was telling us the life, their lo people's life conditions, their housing, their transportation, their family, et cetera. So it is all of these things and their interaction that we have to think about when proposing workplace safety or health promotion programs or something that combines all of those. And I think what we have to keep in mind, and I'm st I still see even in a lot of the talks we've forgotten or not necessarily aware of, that actually employees have no control over 99% of what happens to them at work. 
nor do they actually have very much control about what happens to them away from work. And there are many, many determinants, now we call them social and structural determinants, that, uh, that have huge impacts on where you work, where you play, where you're educated, et cetera. So keeping that in mind, it isn't an intervention aimed at workers that's going to get you anywhere. And really what we need to be thinking about, not just in the context of a hierarchy of controls like industrial hygienists think about, is that we need multiple multi-level um, interventions focused at all levels, but starting at the top and working down. So um, anyway, I briefly, the, the project that I worked on, which took place from 2010 to 2014, was a National Institute of Drug Addiction project, an R01 with Deb Henriquez, who is in epidemiology. And this was when I was at the University of Minnesota. And her focus was on smoking cessation. It was a random group randomized trial, very similar to the types of uh, um, studies that I've done with Dr. Parker. We had 45 small manufacturing companies. They ranged from 20 to 150 employees. We actually stratified in our randomization into small, less than 50, and large, greater than 50 employees. And we did, uh, it's very hard to do controls, uh, true controlled um, studies. David and I have uh, published about this. So we did a sort of immediate intervention with a, the uh, intervention group, and then um, a delayed intervention. So everyone got the intervention, uh, one year of interventions, which means they'll all sign up and participate. Uh, if you tell them they're control sites, they won't sign up. They're very high, and it was prompted by uh, Deb's work in other workplaces and other settings, but really high smoking rates among production employees. And so, you know, we've been very successful in changing smoking rates in the population, but there are very, still some populations where smoking rates are very high. Production employees is, is one of them. Um, previous work, done by Gloria Sorensen, and Tony was part of that, uh, pro those projects, where they demonstrated they were doing some kind of an integrated safety plus health promotion approach was more effective than just health promotion alone. And then small businesses being less likely to offer health promotion programs, we decided to focus on, on those in particular. And the goal was to increase employee quit attempts by motivating employers to make workplace safety improvements in combination with policies, environmental, and other changes that would support a non-smoking workplace. So I should be clear, this is sort of the old-fashioned model of total worker health, where it was health promotion, um, but you know the impetus or the um, synergy, shall we say, was to imp improve safety to gain uh, worker uh, buy-in to undertake health behavior changes. It was designed to be disseminable by public health departments. We did use the REAIM model that Lee described. Um, and uh, what I'll talk about are some of the results and then a lot of the challenges. So we recruited in the metropolitan Twin, Twin Cities areas. This was the first time I actually tried to, we, I, I was in a study where we recruited through the HR manager, so I learned a huge amount about their lives and jobs. Um, we did baseline and follow-up surveys of all the employees, and um, we basically randomized, we did share survey results with all the businesses and used those to um, tailor our interventions. Um, <clears throat> pretty good return rates. We had a great research team, but these are the, some of the things that were on the surveys. Um, perceived safety risks, safety improvements. Some of those are open-ended questions. We asked a lot of questions about smoking and smokeless tobacco use. And a number of organizational variables um, you know, that we took from a variety of surveys on safety climate, job stress and strain, and coworker support for quitting, among other uh, types of variables. The intervention basically started with a meeting with the safety committee to discuss results and motivate improvements for workplace safety, making, then making presentations to managers and employees about smoking cessation. Um, offering free nicotine replacement products first as tri trial kits and then two-week um, two uh, supply kits, um, various newsletter articles, fact sheets, et cetera, on smoking cessation, trying to work closely with the HR director in providing uh, resources. 
And um, we also provided very small grants, about $500 for safety improvements and a couple hundred dollars for break activities that would, healthy break activities that would be um, alternatives to going out and standing outside and smoking. As well as a website with a lot of additional resources. Most of these things were not things we needed to create. A lot, a lot is available. And as I said, it was to be disseminable by a small, you know, public health agency. So the idea was to use what's easily already readily available and demonstrated to be um, uh, efficacious. So in terms of results, of, and I'm not going to go into all the details, we have published some of these. Uh, we're still working on our follow-up paper, but the baseline studies uh, results have been published. Most of our companies did make at least one safety improvement based on employee input. About half of them used the safety grant, which surprised me that we only got half. And the safety climate scores, we did see uh, some significant improvements in the intervention versus the control sites. Now, recall the control sites were, were delayed intervention sites. So basically, we uh, did baseline surveys there and follow-up surveys without doing intervention and then followed the um, follow-up surveys with the intervention. Um, in terms of smoking, unfortunately, we did not see what we'd hoped to see in, in terms of difference in percent of smokers or quitters between the intervention and control sites, but we did get a lot of, of smokers trying the smoking cessation aids um, as you know, one would expect in the intervention versus the control sites. So our handing out samples did make a difference. Um, so quitting smoking is a really, I, any of you who know, is one of the, it's the, one of the most addictive substances out there. Um, people do multiple attempts at quits, sometimes over multiple years. Um, quitting is a really, really complex problem, a very difficult problem. And our expectation that we'd see a lot of quits in a year might have been, um, you know, unrealistic. But what I am going to talk a little bit about is what some of the results and challenges suggest to me for a study if I were going to um, redesign it. So first I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. I don't necessarily have the answers to all of these, so hopefully it'll get you started thinking about if you had to redesign a study like this, what would it look like? What we did find, surprisingly, was my, not just high smoking rates in the production workers, but also among their managers and almost, almost the same rates, and also among support staff, a lot of whom were clerical, um, and even some of the salespeople. The lowest rates, as we did expect, were in managers and the R&D and engineers. So a question might be, who should have been the target of our intervention? If, if you recall, the targets were for safety, um, getting the HR manager and the safety committee and the owner to make a change, um, but most of the target for the health promotion was at the work, worker level. Um, we also, when we looked at job strain and job stress found, and this has been found in other literature, the people with the hardest jobs, um, highest demands, the lowest control, production workers, production managers, and support staff have the highest levels of job stress. So what else could we have targeted in, in addition to workplace safety and, health, and smoking cessation? Um, production workers were least likely to say that their co-workers were going to be, were supportive of their smoking cessation efforts. So that question suggests a question, how could we have designed the intervention to change that? The lowest safety climate scores were among production employees and support staff, as, as you might expect, based on the job strain and stress um, uh, results. And employees were able, to, however, to identify important safety problems at their workplace. And this, to me, suggests participatory, a little bit more participatory kind of research design, but thinking about what else could we have done to motivate safety improvements. Um, it, came, it became another, a very big challenge was scheduling our intervention activities. And we didn't require a huge amount of time. But to get time off with production employees who are given two breaks, one 20 minute in the morning, one 20 minute in the afternoon, and no specific break at lunchtime, a lot of, if they wanted to take a lunch break, was an unpaid break. So they have to clock in and clock out. Many of them don't do that. They work through. And if you, we looked at the work hours, we didn't have very many part-time workers, but we had an amazing number of people working 40, beyond 40 hours, up to 50 and 60 hours. 
So um, this is, uh, there's a lot to be said here in terms of how does one do a health promotion in intervention or a workplace safety intervention for that matter when you actually can't interact with the, peop with the people uh, who need to participate. Production managers in particular were very non-supportive and major gatekeepers. They would not give us the time off to do the surveys. They would not give uh, workers the time off to participate in the, in the um, sm smoking cessation intervention. And so we also found, and this was sort of a precursor to my understanding of precarious employment and the Fisher workplace, there were a number of companies that had temporary workers, and when the research team came back and asked me, well, should we be telling them to include them in the survey? Should they be included in the, in the activities? Um, I wasn't sure. And when they asked the HR manager, they all said, nah, they're not really employees. So, so the question is, should we have included those people? Um, if I learned a lot about working with human resource managers. They are, in small businesses, they're the ones who are doing everything, as far as I can tell. But they also have, don't have a huge amount of training. They don't have a lot of support. There's a lot of turnover, especially in smaller businesses. They're really busy. They're expected to do a huge number of things. And I think we heard about that from, from uh, someone earlier in the, the week. But how does that impact your intervention? And that wasn't something I was at all aware of. Safety committees, only 17% of the uh, companies, 17% uh, uh, of the committees, uh, companies actually didn't have a safety committee and never formed one, even though that was sort of a condition of participating in the, in the study. How, again, I might go back to that same question, how else do you motivate safety improvements? So what would I do differently now? Well, actually, I have to tell you I have more questions than answers, so I'll still keep asking questions. But I do have a different perspective on total worker health. Um, it isn't just workplace safety plus health promotion. And NIOSH has recognized that. A lot of total worker health centers now, of course, know that. And there are many better studies or better designed studies that incorporate that understanding. So I'm, we were very much at the beginning of doing an intervention study based on a relatively older sort of out, um, outmoded uh, understanding of total worker health. Um, but I would ask as well questions like, is smoking really only a personal behavior, or does work and workplace play a role? I suspect it does. Do high levels of workplace stress and job strain contribute to smoking, or maybe make it more difficult to quit smoking? There actually aren't as many data about that as you would, would think there should be. Are there other psychosocial stressors, hours worked, breaks, coworker support, supervisor support, that might play a role in how easy it is to quit smoking? And is a single safety change really enough to demonstrate commitment to employee health? What else should we have done? Um, I would have screened businesses more carefully for readiness, and um, some of the total worker health centers now have tools for this. But I think we need to explore this further. What is it we should expect from a business that participates in a study like this before they get started? Because you, you can set them up for failure, if you have high expectations for what they're going to do, and they're not ready to do that. And I've listed just a few of the things I might ask um, for readiness. I would, um, in retrospect, consider um, much more carefully the role of production managers. Maybe they should have been the first target of our intervention. Um, maybe they would have been so, a, a good partner, actually, for our intervention in the long run. Uh, you know, target them in addition, in, with respect to their smoking, and then have and then elicit their support. Maybe I also would probably try to have a better understanding of the impact of work and stress on smoking. And think about what I could have motivated in terms of changes in the workplace, in the working, and in the employment conditions, not just the workplace um, itself or health promotion. I would have considered the role of coworkers. Uh, I think coworker support might actually be very important for a lot of things, not you know, in terms of personal health, as well as, and we do see this in the literature as well as whether or not one can have and operate a job safely. Your coworkers are really key to making that possible. Um, so, how can we positively impact coworker support if it's low? And I would have encouraged a company to allow participation of all the employees, including their temporary and contingent workers. And how would I have done that? Um, so I, 
alluded to the hierarchy of controls, and so I would say the hierarchy of controls is important. Two minutes. Um, in, in terms of thinking about this, and I do appreciate NIOSH has got a hierarchy of controls that I'll call your attention to, but I might suggest a slight change to this that it's actually um, a combination of all of these. So yes, you should start at the top with eliminating working conditions, but you should perhaps be doing things at all levels together. And so a total worker health program for smoking cessation might be encouraging organizational and management policies in involving production sub supervisors and employees in a more participatory um, approach, including all workers, and recognizing the gatekeeper role that production employees play. So returning back to that take home message, um, I just want to emphasize again, um, employees don't have a lot of control over much of anything related to their health, although we talk about personal health behavior, but in the context of work, there are many factors and features of work that make health behavior um, changes complicated and difficult. And I think our interventions in workplaces should be multi-level and, and multi-nature, uh, multi-factorial and never focused only on workers and employees. Um, this is what we're doing next. It's, uh, I'm now a director, what wasn't in my bio, but I'm also a director of a new uh, Center for Excellence, Center of Excellence for Total Worker Health for NIOSH, and I thank them for that funding. And we're the UIC Center for Healthy Work, um, where we're actually doing work for precarious jobs, but entirely outside of workplaces, which is a whole new challenge. So anyway, thank you. Kind of a, a comment. Um, my background too is in public health. I, it's all smoking, tobacco control, and in that arena, um, we have a hierarchy as well. It's free dance pyramid. It's completely upside down, but it's basically the same idea. Um, however, that pyramid has one additional level, and it's the social determinants of health that our hierarchy does not. And uh, it's always struck me that in working with businesses, there's there's sort of an attitude of like, if it's inside my doors. I care about it. If it's outside of my doors, it's not something I have any um, influence over, really tend to care about. And yet we saw from this morning's discussion that uh, there certainly is a role for looking at a broader community context to attract business, to grow an infrastructure that really is supportive of business, um, things like housing, um, economic development, um, a wider range. And I'm wondering, um, it, it, that's not an area I've yet seen a whole lot of focus on with, with this, with, with safety folks. Mm -hmm. um, and yet I do think it's an extremely important area. And I'm wondering if there are um, crossovers, better crossovers that we can make between uh, the business and the workplace end and, and public health. I, I will say, when I switched roles, um, I no longer see anybody that I knew in my former yes. <laughs> context. <laughs> at all. There's no crossover. Right. Um, and I'm wondering if there are ways we can structurally start to, to create better crossover or start to reach into those uh, more social determinants. Yeah, so I totally agree with you. And in fact, this new center is a combination of um, all the different disciplines in a school of public health. And that's actually a very unusual thing. Um, I do a lot of work with people in occupational health and safety physicians, and we think of it as interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary, but it's not interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary in the context of public health. And so putting, I have, you know, community health researchers and health policy folks and environmental and occupational health safety folks, and what I realized quickly and early on was we don't all speak the same language at all. In fact, the word community means a whole lot of different things. And so I, you know, I sat through a whole two hours of our first meeting, everybody talking community, and I realized at the end we had, we were like defining that completely differently. So a lot of it is exciting and absolutely necessary because public health actually is inside the work boundaries and outside the work boundaries. It is all of those boundaries. And it is time for all of us to start working together, especially in the context of what's happened to our economy and our jobs. In, and we should all be working on employment conditions like minimum wage and eliminating tipped wages and all sorts of other things that I know occupational and safety 
people feel really squeamish about when I, and I do too, because that's not how I was raised, so to speak, in thinking about that. But my public health colleagues have no trouble having conversations about that. So we need to be bringing many more and different people and all that expertise to the table in solving the problems around worker health. I really appreciate this presentation. It's very, very thoughtful, and, and you know, we, we've been uh, also coming at it um, with this hybrid of public health speak and um, you know, occupational health and safety speak. What's interesting to me is we've sort of arrived at some very similar conclusions, which is that we have a hook for bringing public health people into occupational safety and health. Right. And that's the thing, the thing I'm seeing in, in our school, um, but I'm also seeing in the community. So you, you know, your point, I thought, was really important that you didn't have to invent ways of uh, addressing tobacco cessation, right? Mm -hmm. That's out there. In fact, what you had to invent was a platform for bringing public health into the workplace. We have public health people who are craving audiences like we have in the workplace. Right. And so it's really about bringing, bringing the established uh, tools of public health into play in a place where public health can be practiced. And that's, that's what you're doing. And right. I, I think that's fantastic. But I also might suggest, Lee, that what we're also doing is taking our occupational health and safety perspective outside the boundaries of work. And community health science, scientists in particular, are really good at operating in communities. And when they say communities, they largely mean geographic ones, not always, but um, outside of the workplace boundary. And so you're right, we have a hook, but we also have as much to learn from them as they have from us. And that's actually quite exciting because it's now beginning to make a much bigger set sense to me that I'm not just forced to think about workplace conditions because I know that that's not what makes good jobs and healthy jobs. Yeah. Thank you so much for this presentation. I'm, I'm just, the only sad part about it is I wish you would have been speaking the first day because I think that everyone, um, well, I'm a trained public health person and I don't, identify, I do a lot of worker health stuff, and I don't identify as an occupational health person because um, for all the reasons that you just kind of laid out, when you talk to people in the community, one of, actually one of my students said to me the other day, she said, Dr. Salvatore, when we ask people in the community what their issues are, they talk about, you know, this is our word, but social determinants of health, and then when we create our interventions, they, they don't, touch any of the things that people talk about. So, um, you know, work is front and center. I mean, you don't need a model or some theory to let, you talk to people in the community, work is front and center. And these values that have been discussed about across populations, family, and all these things are just critical. And um, so I'm really curious about what's coming next for you. I mean, I appreciated your candor in presenting your work and being thoughtful about where you thought it was limited and where we need to go. Um, but, uh, you know, what this is going to look like because um, what I think, you know, what has been most powerful in the work that I have done are things like community organizing and yes. things um, like popular education because we're really talking about, when we're talking about whatever word you use, vulnerable, poor, disenfranchised, we're really talking about people who are just, they are, um, they are being told that they are worthless in every area of their life and they're facing major constraints and more than ever. So I'm just interested in terms of what are you doing in this next step if we have time or I'm happy to talk to you elsewhere um, because I think this is, this is innovative and this is where we always say we need to go, but it's just, you know, there's people doing it, but we don't get together enough and it's hard to find out. Yeah, I probably don't have enough time to tell you what we're doing, <laughs> but there is a website and I am glad to talk with you about it. And it was, it was a moment of thought that I might have that conversation, but in the context of small and medium enterprises and the work that we've done, um, I wanted to show the evolution that is necessary from thinking about workplace workers in small and medium and medium sized enterprises to thinking more broadly about public health and worker health and safety. So thank you for your comments though.
So I'm going to bring another kind of multidisciplinary area into the conversation. I'm from the healthcare and health promotion um, background, and it occurs to me after hearing the last couple of days of things that there's an opportunity with some of the strategies that we use around um, personal behavior change. Uh, in particular, what comes to mind is motivational interviewing techniques, where we really look at addressing and talking to people and really listening to people on an individual level, but I think this could be also taken into a business to say, what are your barriers? Because I'm hearing a lot of barriers over the last two, two days, but we haven't figured out how to help them through those barriers. And the best way is to listen to them and then help find those resources. And so when you think about safety and personal health, there's barriers to everything we're trying to do, whether we don't have um, family support or work support or whatever that is. Um, and I've done a lot of smoking cessation. I can absolutely tell you when I ask people, do you smoke because of stress? Absolutely they do. And my smoking cessation classes become not about NRTs and strategies for quitting. They become how do I handle the conflict uh, at work, the uh, stress at home. And we spend sessions on that and we don't even deal with smoking cessation techniques anymore. And so your, your conversations change when you start asking that question, what are your barriers and how do we help you remove that barrier? And, and you get all different kinds of answers and I think there might be some synergy between health promotion and safety and how do we marry that strategy together uh, into that workplace. I think Tony might be talking about some of this <laughs> and it's his turn. So thank you very much for your, for your comments.